Hi, good afternoon, Highline College. Uh, Joshua Magallanes here. Uh, probably for some of you a familiar face, uh, if you're a part of Puente or have been at the college for a few years as a staff or faculty member. And as students, you are our pride and joy and we are so excited to be able to share some helpful presentations in, uh, via webinar style so that we can help you get through the home stretch and help you cross that finish line in June, whether it be completing your first year here at Highline, or if you're graduating and, and going on to the next step, whatever that may be, maybe it's into the workforce, or maybe it's to a university or a college where you'll be continuing your studies. And so this is an exciting time for everyone. I also wanna acknowledge that the land that we are virtually on today um, and at Highline and the surrounding areas is on sacred ground. And so I want to acknowledge that and the people that lived here and whose land we are occupying today uh, before the sellers um, took um, this land away. So I want to acknowledge that and also want to acknowledge my indigenous side, my Apache side, um, as I come from Arizona and uh, and I bring them and my ancestors whose shoulders I've stood on uh, to be here with you today. Today I'm going to talk a little bit about anxiety and probably at this point we're feeling overwhelmed and probably all zoomed out as the title says. Uh, and so we're going to have a, a little fun with anxiety. If you've heard me speak before, that's kind of the name of the game. I'm very informal, but I like to give good nuggets, good pieces of information that are tangible, uh, items that we can take further with us, use in our everyday life. So they're things that we can remember. I'm going to talk a little bit about priming the pump and start. Um, idea and what that looks like, especially when we're trying to curb anxiety. I'm going to also talk about time tasks. Uh, you know, when we think about anxiety, we think about how we can't control the future or what is coming down the pike. And so I'm going to talk about those things. Um, and I'm also going to talk about behavior because behavior really drives our anxiety and, and our outcomes. And so when we can have or gain some self-awareness and acknowledge what that is and what that looks like, we can then start to reframe really how we react to certain situations. Uh, you heard earlier from Nicole who gave a great uh, introduction to mental wellness and mental health and what that looks like. And especially as we're in a pandemic currently, right, a lot of stigma stems from folks maybe not knowing the ins and outs of mental health and, and what mental wellness looks like and therefore we jump to conclusions and so probably as you started listening to news and hearing more information about COVID-19 and the coronavirus you started to feel a little nervous. Uh, I, I know I was probably uh, one of those late folks to sign on to that anxiety because I had to go into crisis mode. And so as a therapist, when I go into crisis mode, I go into what does everybody else need and then look in to see what I need. And as I went through that journey and that experience, I had to realize that I also too was experiencing a lot of anxious sensation and feeling and emotions around fear. And it finally came to a head when I was able to have a Zoom session with my family. And one of the things we talked about was how we've not seen each other in some time. I'm again from Arizona, so I've got a brother who lives in the town I grew up in of San Manuel, and my mother who now lives in Tucson, Arizona, along with my other two siblings, one who lives in Detroit, Michigan, and at the time they were really on the rise in terms of their numbers and individuals who were uh, contracting the, the COVID-19 virus. And then my other brother, my youngest brother, Mario, who lives in Federal Way, so some support here. However, our conversation kept uh, moving and growing, and as we started to talk and, and folks uh, fell off, if you will, the Zoom meeting or a happy hour that we had and it, it ended up just being 
the four of us, myself and my three other siblings, we were able to have a deep conversation and we were able to talk about what COVID-19 and the coronavirus really meant for us individually. Now, this is a conversation with three, excuse me, four men who, when we think about society, right, and how society views men, these are conversations that we typically don't go into. And so for me, this was exciting to engage in conversation with them. However, I was also anxious because I didn't know what that outcome was going to be like. I didn't know if my brothers were going to want to engage in a conversation. I didn't know if they were going to um, want to dive deep into what sensations they were feeling around fear or angst or anxiety. However, by the end of the conversation, we had all come to a pretty close consensus that we were all pretty fearful, fearful of our mom's health, hoping that she stays safe and also for ourselves and our families, and that they all stay safe. Out of the four of us, two of my brothers were actually deemed essential workers, meaning their states, respectively, as Arizona and Michigan, sent them a letter saying that their jobs were essential enough that they needed to attend work daily. And so we began to think, and I began to think about how that would affect me and how that would um, really uh, move from what I knew was uh, what was to this new space. And I don't like to use the term new normal because uh, it, especially in the therapeutic nexus and, and the environment, right? Nothing really is normal. Um, and we don't want it to be normal. We want to be able to have some growth and, and have that growth edge move. And so for me, I went through this list of bullet points internally uh, and also with my younger brother, Mario, we talked about like, what is normal and common, right? And so for he and I, normal for us is like looking at the situation and then kind of filtering through, well, what are the things that I can hold on to? And what are the things that I should really let go of, right? So uh, what do I have control over versus what do I not have control over? And what is common, right? And so for a common uh, parts of anxiety, right? People will feel fear. Our older two brothers for the first time since we had known really shared that they were fearful for their life. They were fearful for their family and didn't know what it was gonna look like. In fact, one of my brothers shared out, right? That he um, was worried because he was actually the supervisor who had to decide whether or not his employees would stay at work or have to go home based on a temperature read. Now he's an electrician, therefore he's not in public health or any allied health field. And so that increased his levels of anxiety, right? Therefore in that moment, really unable to manage or in that moment really treat what he was feeling. However, on our end, as a therapist, I know that those are manageable and treatable. One of the things we also had to look at is like, is anxiety is adaptive, right? And so it helps us deal with real danger to perform at our best. You're exactly right. So when we think about folks who have uh, endured mental health, trauma, um, anxiety, a breakup, uh, loss, grief, the list goes on. Times like this where we have to shelter at home or isolate in from everyone else, it's kind of like dress rehearsal. And then they get to go on stage because they're kind of ready for this. They have practiced their whole life uh, depressing or being in an anxious. And so times like this are actually uh, very easy for folks to get into. However, it can sometimes overdefend ourselves, right? Anxiety will take us so far in that we will isolate even from ourselves, meaning we will not reach out to individuals and not acknowledge what is going on internally for us. And so I think it's important and we're gonna talk about that today. Um, and when we're overactivated, right, this idea about um, anxiety, um, really overprotecting ourselves from either impending doom or what might come about. 
So perception plays a big role in how we think around anxiety, right? We think we're in danger. Inevitably, when the virus was in, uh, introduced to us in, in Highline, we began to think about how will we function and how will we um, operate uh, academics at an institution of higher education? Will we stay open and will we close, right? We started to think, wow, what, what, where does that place me? Am I in danger as a staff person? Am I in danger as a student, right? And so we want to make sure that we start to uh, tease out what is real, right? Versus this idea of perceived danger, right? Someone who might be at war, um, an active war and battle, I would say that that probably is danger. It's not perceived, it is reality. Um, anxiety can also be generalized, right? Which is usually felt most of the time or situational. Um, many people uh, feel some sense of anxiety uh, no matter what uh, exercise you're doing. Maybe you're starting a new sport or you're moving to a new town or starting a new job. Those are natural, uh, typical ways of being in the world. Um, situationally, because we know that we will get through them, right? So tests, for example, studying for an exam, meeting with a uh, faculty professor um, or a counselor or even our president, right? That can increase our levels of anxiety. Um, and then therefore uh, we will perform less, right? So many times the chemicals in our body don't allow us to think as clearly because our body is in this idea of chronic stress, which adds to our anxiety. I think it's also important that we talk about environmental factors. You know, a few years ago is, well, each election year, right? We are thinking about like, who is gonna be the candidate that uh, will win the race and what will they bring to our um, individual states and also as a nation, right? Also, when we think about the microaggressed events, right? As marginalized groups and uh, the stigma that comes around um, how we are perceived in the world is very important to pay attention to because that will also increase our level of, of anxiety. Now, what we do is we go into this idea of fight, flight, or freeze response, right? Fear and anxiety will take us to this place where we will fight, meaning we're going to go against the grain, we're going to defend up, or we're going to run, right? And typically, it's usually running or pulling back from danger, right? Sometimes it's better to even freeze, right? Sometimes we've got to stay put until danger passes, right? I gave the example about war. Sometimes we've got to stay hidden. Or if there were a natural disaster like a tornado or an earthquake or whatnot, right? Staying put, staying sheltered, or in this pandemic, sheltering in place until it is safe enough to socialize or be out in public is wise. The things that are usually not as helpful, right, are snapping at people, which is also a natural response. Because if we're in a chronic uh, level of stress, right, we're not just feeling anxiety, but we're starting to feel sad. We're starting to feel um, uh, alone, right? Um, we're also not thinking is clear. Therefore, I'm not thinking, wow, what is this person really sharing? And am I listening for understanding or am I listening to respond, right? To snap at people. The other thing is to flight and to flee, right? Possibly avoiding an interview, um, avoiding a heavy conversation with a roommate or a loved one or uh, and a, a teacher. Um, those are examples that may not be helpful, right? And then I go into that area of freezing up because we're not thinking as clear as possible. And when we get into those areas, the uh, not so helpful ways of being, right? It disturbs a lot of areas, right? Obviously our increase in anxiety, it's gonna disturb our sleep, which then is like a cycle and circles around back to us not being able to um, perform at school, in our classes, or if you're having to work at work better. 
when we started um, the shelter at home and everything moved to online, uh, I am a counselor and professor at Highline and I also have a private practice. And so I had to really adapt to this new way of being. And so I was having to think right from a business model, how do I market and how do I still see my clients and how do I teach and how do I show up for my students in a way that is supportive and useful? Physical symptoms also come into play because when our anxiety and our stress levels are increased, guess what happens? Our increase of heart rate. We start to breathe heavier. Many of you probably thought early on, wait a minute, that's one of the symptoms of COVID and maybe I have the coronavirus, but what it was is it was our body telling us we are stressed out, we're anxious. We sometimes start to sweat. Our immune system drops. Uh, we start to catch colds, we start to ache, uh, numbness. Uh, uh, you know, one of the things I talk about is uh, in terms of being uh, active or exercising, right? My first time out of the gate exercising while we were in the stay-at-home order, it took me a lot longer to get going because my body wasn't used to that. My body had isolated so far away from uh, what I was used to doing that it took me a while to act back up. Dry mouth and digestive issues. And so that's why we wanna make sure that we're eating well, we're getting good sleep, we're staying connected, that we are exercising, right? Because naturally what we do is we get tired, we get irritable, uh, we're not able to concentrate. Sometimes our short-term memory loss will be affected as well. I think early on, many of us, as we moved to meetings that were online and classes that were online, we would forget possibly to turn on discussion groups via Zoom, um, Canvas or that we were to call somebody back on the phone because we're thinking about so many things rather than acknowledging, whoa, Josh, you're taking on too much. Slow down and refocus, right? We jump into these thoughts that are anxious, right? Usually our mind races. And some of you have probably felt that, right? Uh, maybe you're taking two or three courses and thinking, how am I gonna navigate my studying habits and how am I going to tackle my quarter now that everything is online and I've got due dates that maybe overlap with one another or that are on the same day. And we also behave, as the last slide showed, in this way of avoiding, right? So avoidance really starts to pop up and procrastination comes into play here. Uh, and, and, and we wanna make sure that we're managing that and acknowledging this. What we can do to counter this, right, is this idea around mindfulness, meditation, movement, music, and more, the M's, it's like the five M's, which I love. Um, and I, Nicole is wonderful. She shared a lot of this information with me, and so I'm using this. So thank you, Nicole, uh, for providing some of uh, this background information for me. But we wanna make sure that we're being mindful of what we're doing. So not necessarily a meditation in way of um, being silent or being mindful in ways of just breathing, but being mindful in, with intention. How are we showing up versus how do we want to show up, right? And so when we think about that pump start way of being, right, we wanna look at things in small tasks. Be mindfulness about calming ourselves, right? Like, what is it that I can do today? How can I come into myself for a moment and acknowledge what are the things that are most important and prioritize those, right? You can do those uh, by doodling, you can do them via yoga, uh, deep breathing. Uh, in the morning when we wake up, I journal. And so I journal things that I'm happy or grateful or great, uh, three things of gratitude, right? And so, but I also talk about to myself, yes, uh, what do I have to do for the day? I also want to think about when we're being mindful and we're meditating, right? And thinking about with intention, um, how can I reward myself? 
what are the ways in which through meditation, which should be intentional, that I can reward myself. Maybe we're thinking about a walk we wanna take later on, or maybe we're thinking about homework or studying or the laundry or dishes that we need to complete. What can I do to reward myself, right? Maybe if I accomplish 30 minutes of studying, then for the next 30 or 45 minutes, I can talk on the phone, I can play Xbox, I can go for a walk or a run, right? And so for doing those things, we're, we're both giving to ourselves, both in a healthy way, and we're also doing some belonging, right? We're connecting with folks, the earth, and the people around us. We wanna get moving, folks. Um, anxiety, right? When we are feeling anxious, we're not paying attention to uh, our slow and fast twitch muscles that are in the body. Uh, exercise typically, and I say typically, because um, exercise and movement doesn't work for everybody. Uh, I happen to be one of those individuals who, if I'm feeling very anxious and I'm feeling very nervous or stressed about something, working out will actually increase my anxiety. So you have to pay attention to what works. Um, our bodies are made to move and need to. Uh, we talk about all the time that if we stay sedentary, right, our bodies then start to degenerate and exercise, right? Exercise is medicine or medicine is exercise, however you want to say it. It does, it, increase, it increases endorphins, which help us um, in the anti-aging process. It also helps get our body functional again, helps our joints move, increases um, uh, muscle movement and you know exercise doesn't have to be horrible it can be fun you can dance uh i hosted a happy hour uh, a couple weeks ago and one of the things i did is i had an opportunity to play music and allowed it to go into everyone's zoom room and we danced for two and a half hours i don't know what's better cardio than that and TikTok. i know people are laughing and creating all these interesting TikTok videos, but it's actually very helpful. You're watching people who are excited and happy. You're learning dance moves. You're practicing them, which is, the, which is getting the body up and moving. This, uh, this picture here um, around what is on our playlist, right? Is, is super important and there are so many ways that we can take a break. If you've got a pet, pick them up, play with them. They are very therapeutic. Um, go for a run if you're a runner and if you're not, remember running doesn't have to be perfect. I'm not a runner and so if I am trying to have a goal of running 23 miles, maybe I should lessen that goal and maybe say, you know what, I'm gonna run two. Mission accomplished. Take a nap, listen to music. One of the things I also share with folks is that while you're walking or being in nature, try not to have your headphones on. Because what that does is it takes us away from being present, i.e. going back to being mindful and being intentional about our walks. Start to figure out how to manage our stress. Acknowledge some of the things that are working. What is in our control versus what is out of our control? Right? I love the second bullet point around establishing worry times and using distractions can also be helpful, right? So give yourself an opportunity to worry about something. Do you want to worry about your exam right before? Probably not, but maybe the day before. Give yourself five minutes to actually say, wow, I am really worried about this exam. I don't know how I'm going to do on it. And then you can reframe that to saying, you know what? I don't know how I'm going to do on that exam, but I'm gonna do the best that I can, or I'm gonna show up today and be the best that I can today, right? So managing expectations. There's many websites and apps that can help uh, with some of these things, ambient noise, uh, create your own soundscape, uh, drawing. There's one I think uh, that I use, I can't remember the name of it right now, but you can color mandalas and it's uh, like paint by numbers, which is super dope and so amazing. 
Uh, and so there's even mindfulness for kids and things to do there. So, and also uh, bilingual. I love this idea. This also comes from Nicole around uh, when life feels messy, right? Think about this in a messy way, which is not necessarily always bad, right? Like move your body, get moving, eat, right? Many times too, what we go into is this idea that because I'm sitting around, I'm going to eat horrible foods and, and then not be this perfect individual. We need to eat to fuel the body. And then we need to sleep to rest, seek community, right? If we're feeling stressed or anxious, I have many friends and people in my community that I reach out to and people that reach out to me as a check-in and express yourself. Use Facebook, use Instagram, ways to still post beautiful photos. I was sitting at Alki Beach a couple of days ago by myself eating tacos from a food truck because I was craving some good fish tacos. And I was sitting there and I was looking at the sunset and I snapped a photo because it was beautiful and I posted it. And I said, staying patient, taking a deep breath, listen to yourself, right? What messages am I telling myself? Are they true or are they perceived truths, right? What does my body need in this moment? Lately, it's been needing exercise, and it's also been needing more food, protein-rich food, greens, because I'm working out more. And how am I showing myself love? And that can be done in so many different ways. We also want to engage in self-compassion. And I do a lot of Facebook Live segments, and my next segment is going to be about finding this perfectly imperfect self because there's this idea that we want to be something better than. We want to have a deeper banking account. We want to have a bigger home. We want to get straight A's. We want to have a better job, a better body, hair, exactly. And really building in some self-compassion and self-love and saying, you know what? I have really good things. I have really good fill in the blank. Um, I love this. Uh, we talk about this many times and uh, sometimes in joking. Uh, thank you, Oprah, for this. Um, uh, in her Best Things TV show where she would say, you get a computer and you get a computer, but you know what? You get a gift, you get a gift, and you get a gift. We have to be responsible and we have to be intentional when we're giving ourselves those gifts. And finally, if it becomes too much, come see us, visit us. Uh, you can call us, as Nicole mentioned, Aisha and Vince, take your calls. If we were in person and we miss you all and are sending out wonderful vibes to you all, um, we would be in the upper level of building six. And we're now offering our sessions via Zoom. So we would love to see you. And I know it's challenging sometimes to um, show us um, you. And it is very, in many ways, traumatic to let people into our homes. One of the things I share with my clients is that I'm also sharing my home with you too. And I want to make connection. And so uh, with that, I will end. And I enjoy being here with you all. And I look forward to answering any questions you might have. So again, if you've got questions um, or even just thoughts or comments, maybe there's some useful techniques that you might use in your everyday living around anxiety, post them up on the Q&A. Remember, we're not all the experts. In fact, we are the experts of our own self, our own body. 
And so please share up any information you might have or questions you might have for us. Uh, yeah, one of the things, uh, this question, uh, I believe comes from a uh, staff individual. Uh, they say that they've become a workaholic now that we are in a stay-at-home environment and doing more work probably online, um, Zoom and via the internet, and somehow uh, the lines between our boundaries are being blurred. And I think that's a very real thing. So I think acknowledging one is very important to acknowledge, wow, wait a minute, this isn't how I used to work before. And so what changed? How come I'm letting myself um, let my boundary fall? Um, so building awareness and acknowledging that is, is key, right? We wanna make sure that we're saying, hey, I'm doing something and I need to acknowledge that and I wanna share it, right? The other thing is, how are ways that we can work better? So even if it's hard to change right away from that boundary setting or being that workaholic and um, doing more than we can, some things that come to mind for me is that when the workday ends, the workday ends. My work will be there tomorrow, it will be there later tonight. So you can always go back to it. The other thing we can do because we're mostly online now is we can break throughout the day. Right, so take small breaks, work in small increments. Uh, one of the things I do is I grade for a little bit, then get up and walk around, grab some water, grab a snack. Uh, I, if I get an hour lunch, uh, one of the things I'm doing right now is I'm also attending a conference and we get an hour break in between. I'm using that to get up and get outside. It's beautiful and so I wanna take a walk or maybe I'll put on rollerblades, whatever the case may be. And so I would recommend those things, but when we bring awareness to uh, some of the habits that we're picking up, it's a lot easier for us to undo those habits. Thank you, that's a great question. Well, it's just about one o'clock, so I don't want us to run over, uh, but please, if you have more questions and um, if they need to be directed individually to any of us, then yeah, we can, uh, we can answer those individually. So we, all our emails are online as well. So have a wonderful day, Highline. Thank you for sharing space and have a great weekend.